Derek and Andy, welcome to Starburst. Hello, sir. Hello. Hello there. So you have a new book out. Um, how would you pitch the book to a, a beloved elderly relative? <laughs> I would advise them to read something else. Um, possibly something with less beheadings. Um, uh, it, my cat, as promised, uh, has decided to interfere with the... Yes, leave it alone, cat. Oh, Jeff. <clears throat> I'm trying to be professional, for God's sake. Um, yes, okay, okay. Pitching it to an elderly relative. Um, Skullduggery Pleasant, once again, and Valkyrie Kane, once again, um, are... Oh, my God, what are they doing? I have no idea. It's called Dead or Alive. I literally finished it about three months ago at the very most um, and immediately went on to two other things. My brain is fried, um, but uh, this, is, this is book 14 of, of, um, of 15. Uh, so, um, I've, and I've been doing this since 2007. Um, so to me, the series kind of is one big long story. Um, uh, and yeah, yeah. So, but this one has the usual amount of, of jokes, horror and, um, and trauma. So, um, yeah, I'll be, <laughs> I'll be suggesting it to every one of my elderly relatives. So Dead or Alive is quite a big book compared to the rest of the series. It's like, I mean, if I if I was to accidentally drop it on the foot, uh, I would be quite upset. Um, mm -hmm. Why is it so big? Is it is it just because you've gotten to the point where you know the fan base will just want to read it? Or is it because this is the, you know, because, you know, the, the story of the assassination of Demol Damocles Creed deserves all the pages or what's going on there? It's it's um, it's a bit of both. Um, uh, I know that the audience will will read it. There is an audience out there, which is a wonderful uh, bedrock for an author to start uh, fr uh, from. So I know that the audience will read it, no matter how long it is. Um, I. I, I mean, it, this is essentially phase two. Uh, the first nine books were phase one. And I realized as I was, was coming to the end of phase one, the books were getting substantially bigger. I think the third one is, um, sorry, the, the ninth one is about three times the size of the first one. Um, so, and then with book 10 and phase two, I tried my very best to get them uh, down um, because uh, publishers they love a long running series but they also love uh, shorter books uh, for the foreign translations they love the shorter books especially the Germans because a German a sentence is usually twice as long as an English one so when they translate a long book it just expands um, so I, I've been doing my best to keep the books uh, shorter, but um, the the story will unveil itself. Um, I thought that this book was going to be pretty manageable in terms of of length, uh, but <laughs> I, 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 I disappointed myself again with my lack of, of foresight. Um, uh, and the, the, the fact is, when you get to book 14 of a series, you're talking about multiple characters, multiple storylines, and multiple plot threads. And you, you can't really um, uh, tie them up in anything less than a hefty tome. So we, we know you're a massive fan of kind of supernatural horror and supernatural comedy and that sort of thing. Uh, you, you establish as a huge fan of Buffy and this 
sort of thing. Why did you decide to go for supernatural stories to that appeal to a younger audience rather than straight up horror? I'm not entirely sure. The it okay no I I am the the, the answer is I didn't have a choice. Um, you get ideas, and some of them are pure horror, pure horror uh, for adults, um, and you file them away in your a uh, grown up section of your brain, um, and then there are the ideas that they tell you who they are for. So I got, when Skullduggery Pleasant popped into my head in 2005, um, he was a skeleton a detective. I saw him immediately. He had the suit, he had the hat, he carried the gun, he drove the car. He was the old style private eye, a uh, private detective. Um, he just happened to be a skeleton. And I, at that stage, um, I was, was writing screenplays. And I, in fact, I was over in London for a few days to do a series of pitches to try and get my next film made. Um, but I was firmly in the mode of horror writer for adults. And so when Skullduggery popped into my head, I suppose there was a kind of a struggle between uh, trying to shoehorn him into my what I saw as my natural uh, playground, which was horror for grown-ups. But he he told me he he told me that no, I'm for everyone. Um, so. Uh, I mean, I've 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 done my best um, to write him for everyone. I've done my best not to to direct him towards a younger age group. Um, I think the the reason why some books for for younger readers do not s succeed is the fact that they they take their audience into too much account and they pussyfoot around a certain a topic, certain areas of the story. They scale it back, they tone it down. Um, I've, I've, and I have toned it down. There, there, there is, is no cursing. Um, uh, there's a certain kind of, of description is not included in this book. My editor has, over the years, steered me towards, steered me away from um, uh, a certain emphasis. Like there was, there was in book eight, as it is now, um, two essentially as uh, superpowered uh, bad guys are battling each other in a city. And as it is now, as the book stands now, uh, one of them, she picks up these six foot uh, uh, fence posts and she hurls them like darts and they hit the bad guy and they explode in a, sh in a shower of splinters and he's driven back and she picks up another one, she fires it, picks up another one, fires it. And um, it's a good, good scene, good visuals. Originally, it wasn't fence posts she was hur um, hurling. She was plucking uh, people out of the crowd and hurling them as wow. darts. And they were exploding. And apparently, that was too much. For, That's a uh, very different <laughs> book. <laughs> <laughs> it was on the knife edge, you know, on, on the knife edge. There was another bit where where she um, pulled someone's arms off and beat him with them. And again, I thought that was hilarious, but I was overruled. I have, I have noticed that one of the advantages of having your main character as a, ske as a skeleton is that parents look at that and go, all oh, right, okay, well, certain things will definitely won't happen. Um, yes. Brilliant. <laughs> uh, we can carry on with that. Um, so you mentioned briefly the fact that you're also a screenwriter. 
and you must get this asked all the time. We're going to ask it again because, like, I'm a fan, and, and I, I, you know, people will ask it why I didn't. So, Warner Brothers, you, you got the rights back from Warner Brothers for the uh, for the movie. Um, yeah. So, what's happening with you know? We live in a golden age of television right now. Everything yes. seems to, you know, comic books from the eighties seem to get, be getting turned into stuff. So, what's happening with Skullduggery? This, you think, <laughs> you think I would be really bored giving the same answer, uh, but I, but I'm actually not because I find it hilarious. Uh, the fact that since 2007, I have given the same answer to this uh, question. We are trying. Um, since 2007, so we sold the right to Warner Brothers. Um, after three years, the script uh, was sent to some very, very high profile uh, screenwriters. Three years later, I got it back and it was literally the worst thing I'd ever read. Um, and I'd read a lot of, of bad scripts, but it was, it was the worst. Um, so we got the rights back. Thankfully, Warners agreed with me. They said, we can actually make this movie. Um, so, and, and so I've, I've, I then sold it to someone else. And then we entered into a partnership with someone else and someone else. Um, we have veered very close, and then we veered away. Uh, at the moment, I we are still working on it. Um, I have completely taken over the scripts. There's no way after seeing what happens when you give it to people who don't understand the characters or the world, they will take the easy way out. Um, unless they're given the time to to properly do it, but if you have a director um, issuing orders uh, at the keyboard, then you're going to um, it's going to go wrong. So I am um, I have taken complete uh, control of the writing. Um, I haven't sold it. I haven't sold the rights for years um, because if as long as I don't sell the rights, I retain a control. Um, so I've entered into partnerships with uh, various uh, companies and I've been with, with um, a group now for the last two years maybe. And um, I like them an awful lot. They're incredibly smart, they get it. And we are close, We're, but in movies, you can say I am close right up until it's screenlit. All the way, you know, from every stage, we, go, we are close. And we genuinely are. We are close. But until we get, we get greenlit, we are close means absolutely nothing. But at the moment, we are close. <laughs> Sorry. So, I, I, and another ridiculous question to ask when you've just got a book out and it's literally... You know, by the time this video comes up, it's like, you know, you'll be able to get it in your hands. Um, what's next? Um, okay, I, I, <laughs> I have, uh, in, in May, we have the Skullduggery Pleasant a Grimoire, which is essentially a guide to the book after many people, my own mother included, have come with me and, and said, okay, who is this character again? And why do they want this? So I've written a guide, which was meant to be really short, but now it's expanded into this huge, big thing. Um, so that's out in May that I've just finished last week. Um, but what is next for me in terms of what I'm, I'm about to embark on, open up on my screen right now, is a file that says Skullduggery 15 Plot. So I am uh, looking at that. I'm revamping it because I will have to start the next Skullduggery book pretty soon. Um, but I'm, I'm getting back into writing short stories, um, um, horror 
short stories. The, my agent has a thing where, where she has noticed that if I'm working on stuff for younger readers um, uh, for too long, then the, the breaks in between become really violent. And the stuff I write becomes really extreme. So uh, I've been working for younger uh, readers for a while now. So the, sh the short stories that will emerge from this are going to be um, quite uh, interesting to actually write. Um, but I don't know what I'm going to do with them. Um, I'm in the, the very envious position of being able to do whatever I want, um, uh, so long as I have Skullduggery uh, finished on time. And there goes my cat. Fine, I'm boring my cat apparently. Um, as so long as I have Skullduggery finished on time, I can do whatever else I want. You have the you, you're in this kind of little kind of clique of authors. Um, including Patrick Ness and Neil Gaiman, and you kind of get in that sort of like kind of, you know, you get mentioned in the same breath when we talk about the stuff. Is there anyone that you would love to work with on any project? Oh, um, I've, 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 you know, thought about the the idea of working with other writers. I don't think I could. I could do that. Like one of the big things um, that uh, readers ask is, would you ever write a book with this other, like big name writer? And um, I happen to believe that writers are far too much of uh, control freaks to to trust a partner. Um, to uh, but I mean there are there are plenty of 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 filmmakers of, um, of film companies that um, I would love to work with. And, you know, like back when we were, were when we were um, actively shopping Skullduggery around uh, in 2008, um, I got to go over to LA. Um, I met with, with, I mean, some of my absolute heroes. Um, met Spielberg I, I I went into his office and he sat down and he told me about repeating the book to his kids and 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 it was torture saying no to Steven Spielberg um it was absolute absolute torture I think as even though we haven't had a film and made um I think it was the right decision because uh, just in terms of control, of the levels of control, but I, I, I that that is one of the highlights of my life um, to sit down and chat with um, Stephen, as I call him, um, uh, and uh, you know we met with with J J Abrams and and um, and the Donners and and oh, it's just you know it was a it was a just so much fun being a movie maker, being a filmmaker. So uh, there are plenty of filmmakers that I would would adore to work with. Um, but uh, yeah, as as writers go, I'm I'm too much of a control freak. You're 14 books in. Uh, the books are so involved that they require a source book um, <laughs> that you're writing. Um, have you, is there any situations where you, you've been writing a story and you go, I've established that they, that can't work, I can't do it that way, and how much do you think you've write, written yourself into a corner, which is a long way around of saying, how long before you decide that you, there's no more that you can do with this world? Um, <laughs> I have, as far as writing myself into corners, I don't believe in corners. And I don't believe in corners for a very good reason. I forget what I've written. <laughs> so in the course of writing the guidebook, I, I asked on Twitter, I asked the 
the Twitter followers. Um, have I made any continuity errors? <laughs> Jesus, I should not have asked that because yes, I have. And I've forgotten uh, that it's because after 14 books, if I write in book eight that these characters have never met before now, and then in book two, I mentioned that a hundred years ago, they were the best of friends. And, and, and so those kind of continuity errors are fine because I can go back with each, when each book is being uh, reprinted, I can go back and make an adjustment. But I've, I've forgotten, I got Valkyrie's age wrong in every single book. Um, and then in, and I tried to fix it and I got it wrong again because I'm good with, with words, not so much with numbers. And I only got this right with, with the help of two readers on Twitter, one reader um, on a Zoom call, and my girlfriend at taking notes. And now I have her age. And I had to go back and alter things in the books to make everything fit. So I'm not good with corners um, because I don't, I don't realize they are there until the book is, is published. And I've done the same thing with the new book that I'll have to fix in a few months time. Um, uh, and as for um, how many are left, I, I, phase two was originally going to be nine books. Phase one was nine, phase two was going to be nine. And one of the, the, the new characters was an American president who was a buffoon and a bloated um, a blowhard based on absolutely nobody, all, all um, similarities to two persons, uh, living or dead is entirely coincidental. Um, but I wrote him thinking that he would never get into office and I wrote him as the president. And I had three books worth of plot lines to do with what he does. And then the real guy got into office and suddenly he wasn't funny anymore. Um, so I scrapped three books worth of plots and my meticulous plan for the nine book uh, phase two uh, was suddenly thrown into the air. So, um, and, and it became six. So I'm on, um, I'm on the, the fifth book, uh, book 14 is the fifth book of phase two. So I've got one more after this and um, back, back when I was coming up to, to, to finish phase one, I had planned it out as nine books and that's it. But um, I realized around book seven that there would be more. So I, and I didn't tell anyone, I didn't lie because the readers would ask, is it really going to end after book nine? And I said, well, I did say that, didn't I? And they went, yeah, you did. And so I didn't have to technically lie to them. Um, and then we came back two years later with book 10, but I have learned now not to commit uh, uh, phase two ends with uh, next year and um, there's always short stories there's always novellas and um, I'm I'm not gonna commit to anything uh, either side of that just a few more silly questions to go um, one that's slightly serious um, if you got to rescue one piece of media and I noticed that you've got a an amazing bookshelf back there. If you got to rescue one piece of media, one thing, and it gets to survive the the, the de death of the sun, so it will last for pretty much forever, what would that thing be? What would you preserve? Oh my God. One piece of art. How I see it. 
Um, oh. Wow, that's a good question. Um, I, it would either be a book or a comic. Um, okay, for some reason, I'm going to say the entire huge uh, series of Preacher just because it's uh, funny as hell and um, and I'm I'm halfway through the series on on Amazon Prime and I know the actress who plays Tulip uh, so um, yeah I'm gonna say preacher good call and yeah. some, some very silly overall questions just to finish uh, Simpsons or Futurama yeah uh. Early Simpsons, um, but I mean, in Futurama, you have the episode with the dog who stays outside, you know, I mean, that episode beats everything. So, okay, so uh, Futurama. Star Wars, Star Trek or Stargate? Uh... It's a it in my head. It's a it's a war between Star Wars and Star Trek. I will go. Uh, personally, I might have gone Star Wars, but if I say Star Trek, then uh, both me and my mother can enjoy it. So Star Trek. It's fine. No one ever says Stargate. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Stargate. Doctor Strange. Doctor Who or Doctor No? Oh. Um, Doctor Who. And finally, Truth or Beauty? Truth. Derek Landy, yeah. thank you very much for your time. And you can uh, pick up the book uh, via Amazon or your friendly local bookseller um, from pretty much now. Thank you.